to the show that'll keep you from falling behind during the week. With your hostesses with no ghostesses, Jackie and Belinda here for the Friday Catch-Up on the Paraclass Radio Network. And hi everyone, welcome to the second last episode of Friday Ketchup for the year. And hi Decky. Hi! Guess who we have on the line with us? Who? Who? We have you, Mary Ann. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry Jackie, I blew that. Um, hi, hi Friday Ketchupers. Yeah. Good to be here. Oh, we've only been waiting two years. Something like oh. that. I'm really, really glad we finally got you. Yay! <laughs> Fangirl squee moment. Yay! Oh, Linda, <laughs> stop it. You're sounding like a stalker. It's creepy. <laughs> oh, look. Has it been that long, has it? Have you guys been <laughs> yeah. going for two years? This is our second year. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And before anyone starts to wonder, no, it's not one of those, oh, she doesn't know, oh, she hasn't read my stuff, oh, God. Yeah, yeah there's, there's not much of that tension going on. <laughs> no, no, we're all good. Much. Oh, not much. Um, has it really it, been that long? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it has. Um, if you've been turning up every week, thank you very much. If you haven't, well, you know, there's you podcasts should. there. You should be turning up. There's no excuse, really. The only person with an excuse this week is my mum because she's out of the country. So, <laughs> Oh, my goodness. So anyway, let's give everyone a little bit of background on Marianne. Just in case Yay. anybody doesn't know who the heck we're speaking to. We are speaking to an amazing lady who has been writing for over 10 years, isn't it, Marianne? Uh, yeah, yeah, getting probably more like 15, 16. There you go. And well, it's not a very... No, Longer. my maths is shocking, just so you know. <laughs> um, the first book that officially went on the shelves, because you did short stories before the first book that went on the shelves, didn't you? That's correct. Okay, yeah. so the first book that went on the shelves in Australia was called Nylon Angel, and it's sort of a cyberpunk story and when you started writing this one you lived in Perth and then you moved to the east coast of Australia and so the book reflects heaps on like the Brisbane area the Gold Coast area places like that but this is like I don't think it's post-apocalyptic it's more dystopian type stuff isn't it yeah I think a lot of people kind of mistook it for being post apocalyptic. I never kind of really say why uh why the society is decayed, but it is just basically a near future dystopia so uh yeah uh and I kind of transferred when I started writing it. I was picturing it on the west coast, but as I moved over here, it suddenly developed into a kind of the gold Coast area. And let me tell you, you read this series, you can actually sit there and you're like, "Oh, I know that bit." I know that bit too. Woohoo! <laughs> you know, like us. Uh, you know, we have no idea what's going on. It's cool. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. East coast of Australia, Jackie. East... And uh, interestingly, um, the east coast, uh, where it's actually set in um, southeast Queensland, but um, a lot of people come up to me and think it's set in New South Wales. So obviously there's um, an, uh, enough, it, it's elusive enough to be kind of anywhere, really. And it kind of is. I mean, unless you've actually been to the Gold Coast, in which case, no, it is definitely up the east coast of Queensland. So <laughs> there's no mistaking that one. You'll have to come and visit, Jackie. Yes. As soon as I win the lottery. <coughs> Sorry. Exactly. Winning the lottery is kind of nice and pivotal like that, hey? <laughs> so once... Which means I actually have to play first because, you know, everyone says, oh, as soon as I win, but no one actually plays. <laughs> oh, we've had some big jackpots going through Australia and I've been playing every time and didn't win a bob so that was kind of annoying but anyway so the Parish Places series finished with Crash Deluxe that's correct and then Mary Ann decided you know what I've had enough of that so then she went and she wrote this high science fiction really intricate you know just real meaty science fiction series called The Sentience of Orion and I read the first book in that series, but I have to then go and read the first book in that series so I can finish the series because it is that involved. You've really got to pay attention. 
And so once you'd had your turn with the really, really high science fiction, you went into, uh, it was, was it Crime Next? I think it was Crime Next. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, The Sentience of Orion was four books. Uh, it took about five years to write. And as you said, Belle, it was kind of high concept science fiction. So it took a lot of research and a lot of brain power that, that uh, I don't think I had um, much of to spare at the time. So um, it was really exhausting. And when I got to the end of it, um, I just well, I needed a bit of an antidote for it. And so I, I started writing a series that was actually set in the contemporary world. And uh, it that developed into the Tara Sharp crime series, which is very like uh, the Janet Ivanovich style of crime, humorous crime. Have you read Janet Ivanovich, Jackie? <clears throat> no. No, she's, uh, she's uh, actually, they recently had a movie out um, uh, based on the first book of her series called One for the Money, and uh, she's a really, she's a New York Times bestselling uh, humorous crime writer. And uh, so, yeah, I just I just had to have a bit of a change, Belle. So, so that one's under a slightly different pen name. No. So that one yep. is, at the moment, it's Marion Delacourt. So That's right. That's fantastic. I think probably the biggest difference between you and Janet Ivanovich is that Janet Ivanovich seems to write to a, a, a system and it, it's very regimented. You know, this happens and this happens and this happens and this happens and it's pretty much the same in each book. And, it, you know, once you've read about the first six or seven Stephanie Plum books, you've pretty much read them all. It's just, you know, the, the detail that changes but yeah i mean she she does have a a formula going i guess and um um i guess the thing that changes is that you know this sort of gradual growth of some of the characters uh and it's it, i think the thing that people like about those kind of series is that they keep revisiting with with favorite characters it's a bit like watching a, a sitcom or a series on tv uh, i think the my books are a little bit there's probably more growth more quickly in the character. Yes. And um, and I also mix up the settings a little bit. So I I think as a writer, I, I tend to write um, – I don't think I'm the kind of writer that you can predict no. uh, across the board in all my novels. So, yeah, you, you don't read me because you know what's going to happen next. You read me because you don't know what's going to happen next. Exactly. And well, the, one the... thing that I've noticed with people that write like a syst- like system writers – they kind of have that belief of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I, I, I mean, yeah, that, that's fair enough. And it's it's kind of brain candy, you know, for those times when you've been reading really heavy stuff and you just need something that's just pink and fluffy. You know, yeah. you, you're going oh, look, to... There's a lot to be said. I mean, look at Mills and Boons. It's been hugely successful. That's very, very systematic kind of writing. I mean, almost to the point of on a certain page, you have to have a certain thing happen. So, you know, plenty of people like to read, um, you know, that, that kind of predictive sort of fiction. Um, and there's a, absolutely a place for it. Um, but I just... I personally get bored if I write too much um, of the, of the same. same. Old, same old. Mm-hmm. So the the one key line that could be, I suppose, classed as a spoiler out of that series, just think Hello Kitty underwear. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. you got to think that, who's in the Hello Kitty underwear, I think. Yeah, and it, yeah. So anyway, the last book in that series, Stage Fright, was set in Brisbane. Yep, that's and, right. Oh, I loved it. It was so much fun. Thanks, uh, Bill. Are those ones available in ebook? Yeah, they are. Unfortunately, like a lot of my books, they're only available either in Australia and New Zealand or the Commonwealth. The only series I have currently available in the US is the Parish Placey series, the first series. But um, as of... Uh, December this year, The Sentience of Orion, the big high concept space opera, that'll be available on e-reads. Um, but a lot of people are buying my books um, and paying the postage, which I feel really bad for them about. Um, oh, they're no, buying it's them from worth Australia. it. It's <laughs> worth it. Totally worth it. So once you sort of, you know, wrapped your head around the crime thing, you know, you've had your fun there, then you decided, you know what? Oh, I've done everything else. Let's go into YA, which is young adult for anyone who doesn't know what YA is. And then you worked on the Burn Bright book, and I suppose that one's called the Night Creatures Trilogy. Yep, that's right, yep. 
So yeah, that one was Burn Bright, was... Angel Arias, and Shine Light, which only came out this month. So. Yeah, that's been a wonderful series to work on. Um, when I started writing it, I actually thought I was writing an adult novel. And then, um, you know, after a couple of drafts, I realised that the main character was actually a teenager and, um, you know, it developed into a young adult series. So I didn't actually start out thinking I'm going to write a young adult series next. It just evolved that way. But uh, it's been a fantastic series because it's given me and you, Belle, uh, a chance to engage with young adult readers who are probably the most passionate readers on the planet, I think. Well, you think about how much YA has changed in 30 years, and it is ridiculous. I mean, back when I was young and growing up, basically you had Goosebumps by R.L. Stein, and you had the, The Babysitter's Club, or you had Sweet Valley High, and that was pretty much everything. So there wasn't really that... You know, that really gritty, we respect you, here have something that's actually worth reading on the shelves. It was just, well, you know, we think you should be reading, here have that. So, yeah, hey, think... hey, hey, I like the Goosebumps. <laughs> I didn't you mind a, the Goosebumps. You and a lot of other people, yeah. I didn't mind the Goosebumps, but I'm not really one of those people that likes to be creeped out, as you will know. You know, hmm. Horror movies are not my thing. <laughs> no, you cry like a little baby. <laughs> no, I hide. I don't cry. I hide. No, you cry. You cry. Don't even <laughs> start with me. You cry. I'm not looking forward to this next Doctor Who Christmas special, I can tell you. But, yeah. <laughs> no, creepy. <sighs> so, um... But yeah, well, I agree. I agree. I think that... Um... I think that, well, certainly when I was growing up, a lot of the young adult books were the old boys' adventure stories because I'm a bit older than you guys. So um, all there was really around was sort of, you know, uh, Tom Swift and the Lion Tamers and things like that, you know, and or Enid Blyton. And mm-hmm. so I think YA has come a long way and I think one of the greats about it now is um, particularly for female, you know, the female role models in young young adult fiction. There's some wonderful female role models now. So, yay. Go us. About time. (laughs) Ovaries. Exactly. (laughs) I will say this, though. I mean, you know, know, because I'm the youngest here. Yay. Hi. Um, (laughs) You know, Growing up, I also had, you know, the goosebumps and all that. And, yeah, it seems like in a lot of ways authors try to talk down to young readers. Yeah. And so, you know, you, if you don't find a book within a certain time span, you just kind of, you know, you're turned off to reading because it's like, eh, everything that I, you know, could even find remotely interesting is adult novels, whatever. Mm-hmm. So it's nice to see a book series that kind of plays up on childhood expectations in a way. Yeah, um, I agree. I think that so many kids, you know, I don't know what it's like in the States, but certainly here, um, the the books that kids read at school that are on the school curriculum aren't um, always chosen because they're going to appeal to children. So uh, we lose a lot of uh, kids to reading because they just haven't hit on the right book at the right time. And I find that really sad. But I, I think probably the school reading curriculum, I think it falls flat because they actually get the kids to pick the stories to bits, and I hated that. It put me <laughs> off reading so badly, like having to pick apart um, the day the after tomorrow, the day after yeah. tomorrow by John Marsden. Yeah, you know they made a movie about that. It's a raging hit now. But when I was a kid, I couldn't think of anything worse to make me read because I'd had to read the first one and it was just, oh, no more, no more, no more. I've had enough. And then to add insult to injury, uh, you remember Dolly Magazine? It's still out, but, you know, it was better back when I was reading it. There was actually a competition to win all of the John Marsden books up to that certain point. And I'd sort of left my you know, left the magazine lying around the house and my mum picked it up and she's like, oh, that looks like an interesting competition. I'm like, oh, yeah, whatever. Anyway, she entered it and she won. I'm like, oh, how embarrassing. <laughs> my mum won a competition in a teen magazine. Oh, my God. And then she's like, oh, okay, you can read them. I'm like, nah, that, you have oh. fun with that. No, no, no. 
And I still haven't been able to go back and read John Marsden at all, oh, simply really? because of having to do those book reports and having to, you know, uh, I just want to enjoy my books. I don't want to pick them to bits. Did you, you know, see the movie? No, I haven't seen the movie yet. I haven't, you know, it's, that that's how much reading in school scarred me. I just can't do it. Can I point out the irony in the fact that an author is asking if you've seen the movie? <laughs> 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 I mean, really? <laughs> uh, so, well, you know, certainly in my opinion, uh, it's a whole... Watching the movie, you shouldn't be expecting to see a, a recreation of the book. You should be expecting to see a different kind of text. So I I don't, I'm not really hung up about the fact that um, books are made into movies. I actually think it's a good thing. It is. And, you know, then you've got the whole, well, you know, if you like the book or if you like the movie and if you like the book, the book, do you like the movie? You know, exactly. I think I think thing. one thing I've noticed is a lot of people, like especially with say like the Harry Potter series and all that, people will go and watch the movies and then they will get interested in the books because of the movies because yes. it's one of those. I wonder if it's anything like this in the books. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think it, there's, it goes without saying that if a, if a movie is even moderately successful, it really helps sales of the book. It mm. does, except if you're watching True Blood, because that is so different from the books, it is not funny. Or Queen of the Damned. Still helps the, the sales, Belle. I mean, well, um, you know, yeah. I mean, I've, I've Charlene been in... Harris has been in the top five or ten for you know ever since the series started, whereas yeah. you know she wasn't before. So, well, she's always been top ten to me. You know, <laughs> fantastic. But no, I've been in the bookshop around Christmas and you've got the frantic new boyfriend trying to find something for his girlfriend and, and I overheard him saying to the sales girl, she really likes True Blood. And she's like, oh, here, go to the Suki Stackhouse series. I'm like, mm -mm -mm -mm. that's the worst oh. thing you could do because if she likes the TV series, it's nothing like the books. Don't do it. Don't do it. You'd be better Don't off picking it, up man. something Don't like Anne it. Rice. <laughs> So, oh, crazy. No, well, they aren't They aren't alike, but it can still help sales. I'm, I get... <laughs> well, people just have to I remember... I stand by that. People just have to remember they're two completely different entities. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. You know, I and, like... You the... know, there are things that you can do in a book that you can't really produce on screen and vice versa. There are things that you can do on screen that you can't do in a book. So they, in, in some cases, they can play very well off of each other, but at the same time, people can get a little... Frustrated mm -hmm. with the special effects and ruin everything. <coughs> Queen of the Dam. <coughs> <coughs> yeah. yeah, well, that's right. Uh, you know, it, there's some really bad examples out there of, of uh, adaptions. There's no doubt about that. Uh huh. Yep. Although, One for the Money by Janet Ivanovich, that was a really good adaption. Oh, you enjoyed it, did you? Oh, good. Oh, yes. Yeah. I love that one. They put yeah. all the important elements in there and the in-between bits were funny enough that you sort of didn't notice that it was slightly different. So, okay. you know, it was good. I, I really want them to continue on with that series now because it's just like, oh, I want to see them do that bit. Oh. Yeah, no, I agree. I'd like to see more. I don't know if there will be. I don't know if it went well enough to actually, uh, you know, to get them the funding for the next one, but I hope so. Well, it was a bit of a flop out here, I suppose, but oh well. But does having your Tara Sharp series be, you know, having that compared to Janet Ivanovich, does it add a little bit of extra stress? Um, I've tried not to worry about it too much. I mean, I understand the reasoning behind it because, you know, you've got to, you know, when I wrote the series under a pseudonym, Marianne Delacourt, that's a brand new name in the marketplace. So it, it kind of directs the right kind of readers towards your books. Um, at the same time, then it sets up the inevitable comparison. And, you know, I've read plenty of reviews that have people have said, oh, you know, this is not nearly as good. And then I've read plenty of reviews that have said this is much better. So I try just to let it wash over my head a bit and I don't get too caught up in it. Um you know, whether or not it's a good idea to have that comparison written on the front cover, I leave that up to the publishers. They're the experts. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just get on with the business of writing it, I guess. Do you find it confuses readers? Um, again, it's a very individual thing. Some people go in um, and love the fact that it's in that same kind of book and other people go in and immediately are looking for faults. So I don't know if it confuses them, but it does set up expectations, you know. And sometimes that works in your favour and sometimes it doesn't. Mm. I mean, I can remember that one time at that signing, I think it was Post Office Square, 
Oh yeah. And you had that lady come up to you and she's going, Oh, are you with, are you the author? And she's like pointing to the just like Janet Ivanovich and you're sort of sitting there and you're going, Yeah, I'm the author. I'm Mary Ann <laughs> Delacourt. She's going, Oh wow, oh wow So she goes in and gets copies and then she's like Oh. Oh <laughs> And she, I think she came yeah. back to get her book signed, but then it was like, oh. And I was like, no, there's not a letdown. Go and read the books, lovey. They are fantastic. <laughs> I'm not, no, I'm not Janet Ivanovich. No. Yeah, look, you know. I mean, I think people naturally compare and they, they like to reference, you know. Like people will say, oh, well, you know, The Sentience of Orion is like Peter Hamilton's space opera series or, you know, Burn Bright is like... Uh, whatever, you know, so it's a natural tendency and I don't think you can stop it. So, you know, I try not to buy into it too much. Mm. Okay, Jackie, you can ask the next question because I've been hogging the air well, the waves. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I have a question that isn't on paper. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Should I be afraid? <laughs> <laughs> mm. I have been given the power! <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, coming from someone who is an American reader, yep. and unfortunately I don't have money to go and buy all of them, although I would love to, um, I do have Burn Bright. I have read a good majority of it, but then it went missing. <laughs> Whoa, that um, sounds evil. <laughs> yeah. They were renovating. I couldn't help it. It wasn't my fault. <laughs> The renovator stole it. Yeah, exactly. it went in a box and went in that safe place. Yeah, that safe place where you you know, you lose all things. That should be like one of your books where you know all the stuff goes into a hidden spot and never comes back because it's safe. The lost sock space. Mm. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I know that a lot I mean, because you are in Australia, so a lot of your books obviously are going to be based. In Australia, yep. but I was just wondering if you know if you happen to ever hit it big in the U.S., would you ever consider writing a book that's set in the United States? Like, would you come over, you know, see things, et cetera, so on and so forth? Uh, look, yeah, absolutely. And in fact, um, the crime novel that I'm planning at the moment, um, I seriously considered sitting in the uh, setting in the U.S. Um, it's it's about familiarity for me. I um, some people can go and write their fiction novel and set it anywhere in the world just by researching, you know, Wikipedia and looking at Google Maps. And, um, I can't do that. I need to have been somewhere to write about it. So it's really more a case of whether I can afford to go overseas and do research trips. And I haven't been able to afford that um, up until this point. So I'm kind of looking forward to hopefully the next few years I'll be able to travel a bit more and therefore diversify a little bit in the settings. So, in answer to your question, yes, I would. It's just opportunity that I've lacked, really. So, if you, so theoretically, let's say you had all the money, you know, there was no issue, you could get up and leave right now. Yep. Where, you know, what would call to you more? Like a lot of people would be like New York or California. You know, would you want more of a a city setting like that, or would you want more country? I mean, um. I'm I'm a city girl in the sense that um, I mean I'm a I'm actually raised a country girl, uh, but the city calls to me. I find cities endlessly fascinating. So, you know, given the choice right now, I would choose either New York or Paris and uh, go and spend time there. I'm really fascinated with the catacombs in Paris, but New York, you know, is probably the city of the world, and um, you know, it burns the fact that I haven't been there. <laughs> It will happen. It will happen. I believe. Uh, one day. Okay. Which of your books are you most proud of and which one was the hardest to write? <sighs> you know, they're like children, Belle. You be <laughs> proud of all of them. You can't single one out or the rest get jealous. <laughs> um, so each one has it means something differently special to me. Um, but the Glitter Rose collection, which is my little short story collection, a little special uh, limited edition hardcover with some pretty little um, illustrations in it, is, you know, it's kind of special to me because um, it's based on my experiences living, or kind of loosely on my experiences, inspired, shall we say. I was inspired by the time I lived on an island uh, off the coast of Brisbane. So... Um, I have a very special place in my heart for that, but 
Um, and what was the second part of the question? Which is the which was the hardest to write? Hardest to write. Ah, oh, no doubt the sentience of Orion series. Probably transformation space because it meant that I had to bring together five or six. Uh, character viewpoints and story threads together and make it work um, in a high concept sp- concept space opera and that was probably the worst case of brain strain I've ever had in my life. <laughs> yes. um, I think I, I think I did. I think I pulled the plot together. I'm pretty happy and proud of that. But it was definitely the hardest thing that I ever did. Well, there you go. Cool. Yeah. So, so maybe that one would be the one you're most proud of. Um, in in terms of well, actually, interestingly, because I did um, over the last five years, I've had a few health problems on and off, and um, I think writing a novel while you've got a lot going on in your personal life um, is a real challenge, and uh, it's like having to get up and go to work every day when you're sick. Um, and so the books that I've written in the last five years have all been very personally challenging. I'm pleased to say that I've come out the other end of that and, and um, that my health's great. But um, Transformation Space was tough mentally, but um, a couple of the other – well, a couple of the other books in the series were just bloody hard to get to the end of just simply because it was hard to get up every day and write. Oh, Well, we're glad but- you did. <laughs> But, you know, people do that kind of thing all the time in their life. So nothing special, but uh, just in answer to your question, yeah. The ones that you have to get through when you're facing personal challenges and keep writing and keep kind of being mentally there with the book instead of elsewhere, that's the challenge. Hmm. So sorry, heavy answer. Yeah, but it's all right. You asked. I did. I did. <laughs> No, I think that was that moment of, okay, so who talked next? What? You do. <laughs> you do. Yay, me. Okay, so I'm going to skip down the line a little bit because um, since Belinda's more involved as far as working with you personally and all that, I leave more of the uh, actual workings of everything up to her, and I'll just ask the you know typical stupid questions because <laughs> that's my place and all this. I'm the filler. <laughs> 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 okay, so um, more and more people are getting interested. So, how can people in the UK and the US get their hands on a copy of Burn Bright? Burn Bright, yeah. Look, that series for me uh, has been wonderful because I said earlier that the young adult community are awesome, and they talk to each other, and they they kind of uh, they're so passionate that they recommend books all the time. And I've had literally endless you know daily I get emails from the US uh, and Europe saying how can I get the book unfortunately the series is still uh, it's been released in um, uh, Germany and just oh sorry it'll be released in Germany next year mm-hmm. uh, there's a Turkish edition out of Burn Bright so if you're in Europe and you can read either of those languages you can go get those Um uh, but it's still not available in the US or the UK. So what fans are doing, uh, they're literally ordering it, ordering it from either Fishpond or Booktopia, which are two online um, booksellers in Australia, and uh, getting it posted out. Unfortunately, Book Depository doesn't have it, so um, which would be you know the first choice because they have really they, they don't charge delivery, do they? Booktopia, uh, uh, Book Depository. Right? Uh, book depository doesn't charge postage. Yeah, but yeah. So, yeah, no. but unfortunately, <laughs> you can't get it there. So, Booktopia or Fishpond. There you go. Do you know if Amazon has it or Amazon? Um, no, it doesn't because it's only published in Australia and New Zealand. Um, it it might be listed, but you can't actually buy buy it through Amazon at the moment. You can buy some of my other books through Amazon. Um, but unfortunately, like you can buy The Sentience of Orion through Amazon UK um, and Parish Placey series you can buy uh, on Amazon.com. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, the Marion Delacourt books and the uh, Night Creatures series you have to order direct from Australia. I hope that will change next year, Jackie. Um, you know, we've certainly um, been trying and we do have a few options up our sleeves, um, but you know. Really slow process. It is. All right, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm waiting. gonna ask one more question that's not on the list. <laughs> uh, oh. Um. <laughs> again, I have the power. Um. Do you find I'm trying to think of exactly how to word it? Because I know a lot of people are 
here and there as far as like ebooks go. Do you find that you'd be like, are you pushing more for the ebooks, or are you kind of going eek eek ebooks? Um, look, you know, they're inevitable. They're here to stay. Uh, I think it would be foolish for any author to, to kind of fight it. Um, and I do think people need a choice. They need to be able to have uh, your work available in whatever format they want. And so, you know, definitely I'm very pro the ebook. Um, but I, I still think that people should have the right to be able to have a hard copy uh, of your work as well. So choice is the key word here, I think. Um, and it may be that uh, we end up releasing the Night Creatures series, Burn Bright, uh, etc., um, in ebook in the US to start. And the thing is, of course, the ebook reading population in the US is much, much greater than it is in Australia. Mm-hmm. When you release a book just in ebook in Australia, still at the moment, you're not. Um, catering to a very big reading audience at all. Well, I know you know one of the benefits for ebooks is um, you know especially in cases like this, you're an overseas writer and people say like me <laughs> who have like no funding to you know import a book basically. Exactly. But you know you go to like Amazon Kindle or you know things like that, and it's much cheaper. Yep. Yep. But in the end, yes, it may be cheaper. But you get more of a profit because there are more and more people that it can reach. Yeah, I mean, on a, you know, and this is the whole thing with um, being able to get the free samples with ebook and everything. I think it's wonderful, and that's why it's really frustrating for me currently um, with regard to the Night Creatures series. Because, I mean, well, I've got uh, seven thousand people want to read it on Goodreads now. That's for a book that's currently only just available in Australia. Um, you know, so the word of mouth has been so good. Um, it's terribly frustrating that they can't even get it in ebook uh, in the US at the moment. So that's that's what we're working on primarily. Mm. And it, it's cheaper. You know, they'll be is. able to buy it for and not have to pay uh, thirty dollars postage. Yeah, because you know the postage is kind of a bit steep. But yeah. I suppose one of the other bit. ways you could do it is you know make friends with an Australian and say, look, there's this book. <laughs> I need you to send it to me. But don't everybody oh, go asking... Oh, you mean like what I did? Yeah. But, <laughs> but I sent it to you because I was planning that we were going to interview Marianne at some stage and you needed to at least have read something. So, you know. Well, interestingly, a lot of people, um, you know, what's been happening is literally that, Bill. People have been talking to friends in Australia, getting the book sent over, and then they've been book touring it so that like 10 or 15 or 20 of their friends all get to read it and pass it on to the next person, which is just amazing. I think it's wonderful. And it's so uh, strange because, you know, five years ago, you know, I think it was Tara Moss or someone like that was saying, well, by loaning someone your copy of a book, you're actually diddling that author out of royalties. But Yeah, um, I mean, there's certainly been that mindset in the past, I think, and I mean... um, you know, it, it, there's some validity in it for sure, but I think our biggest enemy for writers is anonymity. And the more people know about you, the more chances you are, have of actually selling your book. So if a book tour means that more people are going to talk about it and they're all sharing one book, that's great. And the best bit is because there's only one book, they've got to give it back. <laughs> and they're like, I need to read it again. So then they're more likely to go out. And well, you know, all the studies suggest that people that buy ebooks, for instance, and love the book will then go and buy the hard copy because they want to have the artifact. They want to have it and be able to hold it. So, you know, um, I, I think uh, whatever way people can get access to it is a good way. Hmm. And Belinda, hmm. I, know you, I, don't know, I know you don't have an e-reader, but I just discovered like a few days ago, you can actually loan books out from your e-reader. Uh which means yeah which means i can get a book like on amazon and even if you yourself do not have a kindle or any kind of e-reader or anything i can email you this and you can read it wow i didn't realize that is that that's your kindle is it um well yeah yep (laughs) that's according to this you don't have to have like i can send it to either one of you and neither one of you have e-readers or whatever and you can read it on your computer. Yeah, just on a PDF. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Not yep. bad. Yeah. Um, okay. Next question. Um, uh, well, well, we'll keep talking about Burn Bright because, you know, that's the latest release. Oh, 
the last in that series is the latest release. Um, Burn Bright was unintentionally cathartic and <laughs> as, as a fix, fictionalization of certain aspects of your childhood. Do you think any of your other books you've written so, oh, have such close links to the elements of your life? Um, she's an alien. <laughs> Definitely that. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, everything everything I write's got a little bit of me in it. So every every novel's got some connection to some part of my life. Um, but that's the only series that s- connects back to my younger life. Everything else that's come since is probably more my adult life. So, um, you know, like for instance, the Tara Sharp series is, you know, there's an, obviously when you read that, if you know me, you can see elements of my life in it. But um, I guess with Night Creatures, it, it it's the most cathartic of all of them. It's it's sort of expunging some of my own personal demons, which a lot of the other books, that's not going on at all. Mm. So, mm. yeah, but I'm not going to tell you any more than that. No, that's all <laughs> good. <laughs> Okay, your turn to ask one, Jackie. Um, well, first of all, I did read most of Burn Bright. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get there. And, yeah, <laughs> I will. I mean, I absolutely enjoyed what I read so far. I'm not saying I'm not saying that I lost it on purpose, and this is my way of skittling out of it. No, I absolutely enjoyed what I got to read. Um, Thank you. And too. I find, <laughs> I find that. Um, in a lot of ways I can relate because we've all felt kind of trapped and we've all wondered if there's this other great utopia to be found. And yep. unfortunately things aren't always as they seem. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, um, but yeah, so I have to say as far as that goes, I would highly, 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 highly recommend it. But, um, I guess the real question is which of the characters was the most fun to write for you? Ooh, I mean, I think Lenoir, who is essentially the 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 main male lead of the series, and um, because it's always fun creating a sexy hero, um, and even mm, though amen. even though he was, you know, not a typical sexy hero, there was you know elements to his character that well, I can't give too much away, but um, you know, he was a complex character. Uh, he was really fun to write because, you know, that's indulging a bit of a fantasy, I guess. Um, I and uh, the other main <laughs> character, exactly. The other main character that I really enjoyed was Suki, who is um, the main character's best friend. And uh, she was such a – she was definitely a feisty, fighting kind of female, and I love that, that kind of character. And um, she also had a great sense of humour. She didn't take any crap. So um, – Mm, there was nothing not to like about writing about Suki. Mm. So the whole idea of of Retra becoming a knife, you know, oh, yeah. that you know the whole leaving behind your childhood and wanting so badly to be more adult, you know, I think everybody can relate to that. Yeah, for sure. And it was um, a very, I very clearly signalled that by the fact that she changes her name. Um, you know, in, in during the first book, and uh, it's a it's a coming of age story partly, um, and um, I chose the name Naif because Naif actually comes from the word innocent, and even though she leaves her innocence behind, uh, she still maintains a kind of integrity that's innocent, and. Um, uh, yeah, so it was a lot of fun playing. Actually, that was one of the things I really enjoyed about the book was that I played with language a bit and got to create my own words, some of my own words. Yes, and th- there's Marianne swearing in there too. Yeah, and, Ooh. you know, creating swear words that were, um, <laughs> you know, made up. That was that was heaps of fun. I liked it when you did that in the Parish Placey series too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not the first time I've done it, and um, I've kind of learned as I've gone along some of the pitfalls um, uh, that you can overdo it. So I tried to to just be very selective in the Burn Bright series about when I put in made up words and when I didn't. Yes, because well, I was reading a um, a book review for Burn Bright just to kind of get a feel of what I would say because I'm one of those people that script out conversations. Yep. Um, 
and no one ever follows the script. It's horrible. I know. You've got to give everybody the same script. Otherwise, we don't know what the heck you're doing. <laughs> you're supposed to be telepathic. It's not my fault. Well, damn. But, um, you're doing anyway, fine. <laughs> one of the things that um, this reviewer was talking about is um, the fact that that is quite a unique thing. It's also very difficult to create a language. Um, do you find that people use these made-up words like in everyday conversation? I mean, have you heard it come back to you? Um, I do a little bit from time to time, yeah. Um, you know, and I and I, you see funny things pop up. Like on my Twitter feed, I have um, I have a follower who whose Twitter handle is Lenoir. And, um, you know, just stuff like that. Um, people do, if they're passionate enough about, it's fa- you know, it's fandom, they will subsume names and identities into their, into their real life. And um, it's terribly flattering. It's lovely. Um, and, you know, I have um, uh, one reader, a young girl who I, who I really like, who I'm in touch with a bit, and um, uh, she's having a tattoo um, to do with the series. Uh, yeah. Oh, dude, we need pictures of that. <laughs> That's what I said to her when it's done. Oh, we want photos. <laughs> so, you know, that, for the, for, as a person who's created a world and characters from scratch, to have somebody embrace it like that is, it's really the ultimate um, payoff, really. Hmm. So... I know there are a lot of authors that get kind of weirded out by that. I mean, does, like, the yeah. idea of someone tattooing your work on their body. Um, you know, look, I, you know, as I said to her, you sure about this? You're going to be 85 one day with this tattoo. Um, <laughs> um, I haven't had an obsessive fan who's creeped me out like that to date. It's only ever been the most complimentary. Mm. Um, so, but, you know, I can understand how it can be taken to an extreme and how people can find it really uh, uncomfortable. But um, I haven't experienced that yet, touch wood. So, but I suppose <laughs> in a way that sort of drives you to make things even more, you know, more detailed, you know, make it the best that it can be because, I mean, the worst thing you could do would be, like, have a really dodgy cover and have someone have that tattoo tattooed on their butt and then have them walk up and go, look what I got done. And, you know, you'd be like, eh, well, yay. I mean, you can't really control what people do, Belle, so... No, know, remember, I, that, I, I, remember that time we were at the signing with Kylie and that guy turned up and he's like, oh, here, I got this tattoo of the, of the tiger. Was it, a, was it a dragon, dragon or a tiger? I think oh, it was tiger. a tiger yeah, yeah, off, remember, yeah, off white yeah. tiger. And yeah. she's like, yeah. ah, ah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was a beautiful tattoo because it's just beautiful artwork on the fronts of her books. But she's just like, ah, okay. Nice. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I, I guess the thing that would worry me most, that kind of thing doesn't really worry me. The thing that would worry me most is that somebody – uh, especially when you're writing crime, um, takes an idea, you know, a, like a, ah, a, a yeah. negative, sinister idea that you've used and and turns that into a reality, that frightens me. And that's probably why I'll never write um, forensic crime because I just couldn't bear the idea that somebody would, you know... Would do the whole Richard yeah. Castle thing and, <laughs> and switch it around and go, hey, I like you as an author, here... <laughs> Well, no, just the fact that somebody might go out and practice Silence of the Lambs and I'd written it, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. It's like um, one of my favorite authors, Neil Gaiman, yeah. in uh, his book American Gods, he wrote a scam. He'd completely come up with it like off the top of his head and then someone turned around and did it and yeah. was successful yeah. and he felt so bad for that. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And that you do, you know, most writers have a sense of responsibility. I mean, you can't control what your readers do, but I think you constantly have to make choices uh, when you're writing about whether you can live with perhaps consequences of certain things. I mean, you can't predict everything, but you do have to keep a weather eye on it, I think. Hmm. So... I suppose this question sort of ties in a little bit with that one. Um, What's the general process of writing a book from the first word to the finished product on the shelf? Uh, Tell me, Bill. (laughs) (laughs) Everybody has a a different process and um, a lot of people start at the end. Mine's pretty boring. 
I start at the beginning and I write through to the end. I'm a very linear writer, um, but a lot of people don't do it that way. And um, it's just it's so such a simple process for me. I sit down every day and I just write the next bit. <laughs> well, I suppose um, that's getting it done. Yeah, it's, um, um, you know, I may have to stop occasionally and do a bit of research. I tend to be very much... Um, I research as needs. I don't spend months and months researching before I start something, although I do have a science fiction novel idea that I'm going to have to spend a bit of time researching before I start. But generally speaking, um, I go through and write the bare bones of it and then I go through and do any extra researching that I need Um, because the researching is quite time-consuming, as you can imagine, and so I'm very mindful of not getting too waylaid by, you know, going off and reading all these fascinating things that I'll never actually ever going to use. Um, so, yeah, for me, very simple process. Bum on seat, mm-hmm. uh, fing- <laughs> fingers on keyboard and off. Yeah. And, and, you know, you just and repeat and repeat and repeat until you get to the end and then hopefully you've written something uh, appealing, entertaining and interesting. Well, judging by over 11 books, I'm thinking you manage that. So that's good. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. You guys must be sick of my voice. No, we've got like no. 14 minutes left. It's all cool. <laughs> this is called stretching. <laughs> Walk as long as you need. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Okay, so um, what's the next question that we have? <clears throat> Which of your characters was the most fun to write? I already asked that. I already asked that. Well, ask that. You asked that about Burn Bright, I suppose. Oh, well, yeah. at least I answered it in terms yeah, of Yeah, but I mean, like, across the whole... Across the board, yeah. Um, definitely Tara Sharp uh, in the Marianne Delacourt uh, crime series. She's... Uh, I mean, it's a funny series. She does funny things. She's. It's a mixture of slapstick and um, sort of self-deprecating humour, and um, she's just... She's out there, you know. You never know what she's going to do next. She's, um, and it's always fun getting your character into situations and then having to get them out. Um, and I do that with all my characters, but with Tara Sharp, it's fun stuff. Um, mm. You know, with Mira in the Sentience of Ryan series, getting her into situations and getting her out was really hard work. You know, because she, mm. you know, I was I was constantly having to. Um, to go this intellectual game with myself about how I could possibly you know, bring her back from the brink or whatever. Um, so, yeah, Tara Sharp's been awesome, awesome fun to write. And also I was able to dabble in the whole um, sort of dabble on the edges of psychic, uh, the psychic thing, which is um, – it's an area of interest to me. And, in fact, now uh, currently we're just running a series on the site about uh, interviewing uh, psychics, uh, some well-known psychics and some literally um, the person living next door. Um, and I'm finding it absolutely fascinating. You know, I, I'm, jury's out a bit for me. Like I, I don't have any claim to having any psychic abilities, but I am fascinated by it. And this series really gave me a chance to play with auras and um you know, sensitivities to um, body language and all that kind of fringe stuff. So that's been heaps of fun. Oh, fantastic. And and it's giving us a chance to really look at, you know, how different walks of life see things so differently. Well, you know, I found some interesting things when I was researching. They they reckon that um, like something like 75% of communication between people is nonverbal. And um, so, you know, that's a huge amount of cues that we're taking um, from from people when we're communicating with them um, that aren't things that we can hear. So just that whole area of nonverbal communication, you know, that's, that's a, there's a, a wealth of kind of ideas there for writers. There is. And, it, you know, you sort of – you sit there and you think, okay, so – do the people that have psychic ability, you know, are they just hearing things on a slightly different wavelength to the rest of us? The people that can see auras and everything, are they just seeing different light waves than us, you know? Are they pretty much the same thing? They've just got a bit of a tweak in the DNA, you know? It- well, that's right. I mean, we've just run um, 
uh, two interviews on the Tara Sharp site, one with Ezio and Michelle D'Angelis, who, um, who are mediums, who talk to spirits on the other side, and uh, also one with Jessica Adams, who's an astrologer, um, who also kind of has um, medium abilities as well. And, you know, they're just fascinating. I mean, it must be actually really tough to live your life uh, professionally like that and have all those skeptics out there wanting to howl you down all the time you must believe in what you do um, mm-hmm. to be able to survive it and having having naysayers they're just sort of <laughs> 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 well, I think you know, from you know my point of view I think sometimes the naysayers help in a way because it kind of strengthens gives you your fuel. result yeah it's yeah. like I've got to prove this yeah and it makes you you know your abilities become sharper in a way. I mean, it it also has a negative consequence, obviously. But hmm. yeah, well, that's right. I guess it depends on the sort of personality you are, doesn't it? And I mean, some people, um, yeah, as you say, will probably just find it as fuel to the fire. But um, you know, um, who's to say that they're not right and the skeptics aren't wrong? So I'm very open minded about it, and I find it a really fascinating area. And and this, that series has given me a chance to to research and meet people that I I normally wouldn't meet in everyday life. So that's one of the great things about writing is that I have met so many people that, um, you know, if I'd been working down the road in uh, in retail or something that I probably wouldn't have gotten the chance to meet some artists and, um, you know, people of just outside my my everyday kind of living Mm. And speaking of working with artists, you did a fantastic multi-platform release for Burn Bright. And anyone who has an iTunes account, if you haven't already got this song, what the heck is wrong with you? <laughs> um, yeah, you knew. Fantastic. That was a wonderful experience. And that's exact, That's a really good example of exactly what I was talking about. You knew as a Sydney-based um, uh, musician and writer, and uh, they call her the Queen of Morbid Pop. And it fitted her, her kind of music fitted in really well with the Night Creatures series. So we collaborated, and she released a single um, to coincide with the release of the first and second books. And both songs amazing, amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, we had some great ideas for performing together and stuff, but, um, you know, as usual, you have to find sponsors, financial sponsors for that sort of thing, and we haven't really been able to nail that down. But uh, if you go to the website, um, all the links are there to her music, and um, as Belinda said, it's amazing stuff. It is. I mean, I'm... In fact, you went to to see her perform live, Belle. I did. I went to the powerhouse earlier on this year, and it was fantastic. She's such an itty bitty little thing, and she's just got so much oomph, you know. She's excellent, and I was in the front row too, which just made it extra special. So, yeah, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so we're going to play Angel Arias after the show. So stick around to hear it, and then you can go onto iTunes, find it, buy it, and go and get it. <laughs> oh, that'd be great! Yay. Stick yes. around and listen to it. Yes, I love it. I can't get enough of it. I've listened to it a million times. I reckon. And what was the song for the second one? Was it Bluebeard or? It was called Bluebeard. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I... um, it it is. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, you can actually, if you've got a copy of the book or and you've got a QR reader, all you need to do is ping the QR reader, and it'll take you through to a free link of the song. So. I don't have a QR reader. You, on, do you have a smartphone, Bill? No, I have a dumb phone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need my technology to work harder than me. <laughs> uh, okay, well, that, just that's... we can arrange. She still works a VCR, okay? <laughs> yes, my VCR rocks, man. It's you excellent. do? Oh, my God. <laughs> I feel terrible now. <laughs> You've let the secret out of the bag, Jackie. Oh no, it, it's not a secret. People have known that for yonkies, you know. Oh dear. So anyway, so now that we're going to play the song in a little bit, we've also got a giveaway of Burn Bright. Now I'm going to make this international, so you know not only the Australian listeners can do it, and it's only available for the people who are in the chat room. So if you're not in the chat room and you're listening to the podcast, boo for you. Mm-hmm. Um, now, if you've been listening really, really closely, you would have mentioned, uh, would have heard us talk about a character that ended up with two names. 
I want you to tell me what those two names were. It doesn't matter about the spelling because, you know, yeah. But write those two names into the chat room and I will get in contact with the person who writes them in first and I'll send you off a copy of Ben Bright. Awesome, awesome. So Sounds fantastic. And, and I'll give you, if you didn't get them from listening, just go to the website and you'll be able to work it out pretty quickly. Yes, but you've still got to stick around for six minutes. But, I mean, if you haven't got it by oh. now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in six minutes, I've actually got a question. Can I ask a question? Yeah, you can ask a question. Thank you. Um, Belinda, you've been working on uh, on staff at Burn Bright now for um, – you know, uh, since before the book came out, Bird mm-hmm. Bright came out, I think. Yeah. Um, what's been your highs and lows working and how do you feel about what you do there? Oh, the highs. Oh, my goodness. I think the highs end up being when the authors of the books that I review come in and say thank you for the review. Like, we just had one this morning. You pointed out, go yeah. and look at the Twitter yeah. feed. And Karen Mahoney has come in and said, oh, you know, that's a really good review. Thank you. And I tweeted back, you know, when's the next book coming out? Get back to work. And Because <laughs> <laughs> I've waited two years for that book. And it's like, ah, when's the next one coming out? Um, I don't think there's really been a low. It's It's really been... You know, what's the highest point? Not so much what's the lowest point. So, you know, I've been given opportunities that I wouldn't normally have and, you know, I'm just so grateful for that. Um, what, what, um, what's your favourite thing? Do you like doing your columns more or the reviews or what are your favourite thing or the interviews? What, what's your favourite thing to do? Because you've kind of I worked like when it. she does videos. <laughs> you like when I do videos. <laughs> you just like watching my wonky eyes. <laughs> no, I don't. I like watching you go. And this is uh 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 that thing. Yeah. And um um and yeah. Uh... <laughs> and I think you're pretty. <laughs> Thanks. She is. She is. Um, which do I like more? Well, I, I certainly like re- reviewing the books because yep. it's it's really given me such a broad definition of what I read because before I started with you, it really was Lorica Hamilton and, you know... That, Your that, favorite, couple of favorite authors. Yeah, you know, and once they, you know, once I'd read their book for that year, you know, that was it. I was just sitting on my butt, just you know, reading fluff for the rest of the year. Mm. And now it's sort of like I'm looking yeah. for the review books to come in the mail, and it's like, oh, I got this one. Mm. <laughs> That's great. So it's it's a whole lot of fun, and you know, then I get to do. Oh, I haven't so much done many interviews for the Burn Bright side. But, you know, we're getting there. We're getting there. Well, you're doing some now for the Tara Sharp side, aren't you? Yeah. In conjunction with Jolene, who's fantastic. You know, yeah. she's helping me out with that one and I'm helping her. We're all helping each other and it's fantastic. And we're um, a big group of hippies. <laughs> yay, we're going to hug some trees. <laughs> but, I don't know, I, it, it's really an amalgamation of everything, you know. It, it's whatever I'm feeling like that day. You know, I'm so grateful that I have the freedom to say, you know what, I really don't feel like writing a book review today. How about I go and I write one of the Mirror Mirror series? Or how about I hop on YouTube and watch five hours of clips and pick a couple and just chuck them together in a blog, you know. Yep, yep. It's just yep. so much fun because, you know, nobody ever really knows what's going to come out of me next. And that's... <laughs> Kind of scary for you guys, but I like it because I'm keeping you all on the edge of your seats, and it's you know, yay. <laughs> uh, do you enjoy the the kind of uh, connection with all the other writers and stuff in the team? Well, the, yeah, you know. I mean, I love sitting down and watching Krista's videos, and and I love it when Lisa does her life with Lisa because you know, I think she's our youngest team member, she is, yeah. and. You know, she used to do these brilliant YouTube clips, but, you know, since she's in her final year of school, she's really knuckled down for that. And it's sort of like, no, do it again. It was great. I loved your nail polish. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, I like the fact that, you know, some of them I get to know personally, some of them I don't, but I, I enjoy their content. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, I work in a team and that's so good because we're all pitching in and it's just getting the job done and it's 
yay <laughs> yeah well certainly for me that's been one of the highlights of it is uh you know kind of having 10 talented people kind of coming and going and um you know being involved with them at different levels and um you know helping to mentor some of them and you know it's been an overall a fantastic experience for me so not only has writing brought me all the things that I talked about before but it's also brought me the opportunity uh, for this, this this team of writers that we've got together and uh, I'm very grateful to we'll have to get co-opt Jackie next oh yeah we could do that couldn't we because, you know, she's got all this spare time. It, it's it's fine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, let me tell you. Okay, so last question of the interview. What is coming up next for Marianne de Pierre? Well, I, um, I, I'm writing another Tara Sharp novel, uh-huh. and I'm writing uh, another crime novel, which is a new series, which I can't tell you too much about, but it's going to be um, kind of, set around book clubs and things get very bloody. Um, uh, I've also got a couple of proposals in for some children's series, so stay tuned on that. And you know me, I've always got a million little side projects going. Um, I've got um, got the uh, uh, looking at for an artist now for the second issue of Peacemaker and uh, I've got a fantastic idea for a science fiction thriller that I'm just – leading bubble along I'll probably start writing it you know a couple of months time um, I've got to do a bit of research on that so yeah many many things Belinda um, but trying not to get myself over committed so letting yeah. see what letting see what rises to the top first because I can distinctly remember you saying oh, I'm gonna scale it back for next year yeah no well <laughs> actually actually it sounds like I'm not but I actually am in terms of pacing Oh, okay. So yeah, so I'm gonna uh, not overcommit to stuff all at once. I've got all these ideas on the boil and stuff in the pipeline, but I'm gonna space them. So that's what I'm telling myself. <laughs> Alrighty, so we're gonna go chuck a whole bunch of links in the chat room now, and Listen. while you're all listening to the you new song that I'm about to play, you hey. know you, you can all go visiting, but make sure you keep the audio open because you need to hear the song because the song is brilliant. It is. And just one final time, if we haven't had people answer the question in the chat room, we want the character that has two names, and I need you to tell me both names. And this is to win a copy of Burn Bright. So, yeah. <laughs> All righty. So, we have come to the end of our show. Oh, my goodness. Yay! We've been Thank yapping so for much. an hour. This is fantastic. <laughs> See, Belinda, you did all that panicking for nothing. I was doing... Well, it's really good to... Sorry, were you oh, panicking, Bill? Oh, you know, just into a small suitcase. It, it was good. <laughs> Actually, it was me that was panicking. <laughs> hey, it was really good to meet, meet you, Jackie. Yay! Hi! <laughs> that was at the start of the show, Jackie. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yay! Yeah. Bye! Thanks for having me, you guys. It's all good. So, anyone I'm go who. Go have a drink of water. I'm sick of my voice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're used to that. We yap on for now every single week. So, you know. All right, everyone. We will see you again on the 22nd Australian time and the 21st American time. Because we're going to have our worst rapture ever episode. And that'll wrap us up for the end of the year. So until then, see everyone. Bye. Bye. And this has been the Friday Catch Up, powered by the Paraquest Radio Network. Remember to catch the hostess with no ghostess every Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Paraquest Radio Network.